So today we are in the second of a two-part introduction to the gospel according to Luke. The gospel according to Luke, which is the third of the four gospels that we read in the New Testament. Last week, the, the title of the sermon was Be Certain. And we focused on the very last word in the word order and the, the whole development of what's called Luke's prologue in Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. The very last word in the Greek, um, as philia, uh, which means to be certain. Okay, And the message was, we are called to be certain in our faith. Not just to know the faith, but just not only for Theophilus, to whom... Luke is specifically, explicitly writing and dedicating this gospel, but everybody else who believes in it, and by implication, a whole lot of Gentiles, then and now, most of us are Gentiles, are called into this faith of the Messiah of Israel, and to be certain about that. Today, we continue our introduction of Luke's gospel, looking back to the prologue, oh, am I off? Okay. Looking back, sorry. Great. Maybe you'll hear me better now. Uh, looking back, not only, uh, Hadley, happy birthday to you too, by the way. Yeah. So um, not only to, uh, to the beginning, but also the close of Luke's gospel and what happens in between. So this is going to be an, an introduction, an even broader theological introduction to what's going on, what is the message of Luke's gospel that we'll then dig into much more concretely over the next year and beyond as we move through the largest book in the entire New Testament. You know, Luke's gospel, the largest book in the entire New Testament. Okay, today, today's sermon is Luke's gospel fulfilled among us, fulfilled among us. You may want to say that with me, fulfilled among us, okay? And that, that's the language of Luke's prologue. So uh, we're going to open God's word, read the prologue, read the very back of the book, or almost the very back of the book as well, of Luke's gospel. You know, sometimes, are you ever tempted to look at the beginning and the end of the book at the same time before you read in the middle? Well, we're going to do a little bit of that today. And then finally, we're going to turn to Luke chapter 4 and to the inaugural public sermon of Jesus that Luke records. So uh, let's open the scripture. We'll turn to Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Hear now God's word. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished, literally the Greek there is fulfilled, things that have been fulfilled, accomplished, among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers, servants of the word, have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Now, let's go to virtually the end of Luke's gospel in chapter 24. Jesus' words of revelation and preparation for their being sent uh, to his apostles. This is the risen Jesus. Picking up in chapter 24, verse 44. Then he, this is Jesus, said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, so that, another one of those hints there, so that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ, the Messiah, should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. That, he's talking about the Holy Spirit there. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Finally, as I've already introduced, we're going to turn to Jesus' uh, inaugural public sermon recorded in Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, verse 
16 through verse 21. And he, this is Jesus now, this is after his baptism and after the temptation in the Eremos, in the, in the desert, in the wilderness by Satan. Jesus begins his ministry. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He, Jesus, unrolled the scroll. So he's unrolling the scroll. He's, he knows where he's going. He's going to end up at Isaiah 61, what we call Isaiah 61. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news. Here's your gospel. Good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty. Phasis. This is the word that goes back in the, in the Greek, uh, Greek version of the Old Testament to Isaiah 61, and it's about total liberation, being set free. Ephesus, liberty to the captives, and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is the jubilee year. He's connecting all this through. Jesus says, just like Isaiah 61 does. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him because surely we want the Messiah to come and surely we want this final liberation and the true jubilee year to be fulfilled. Man, wouldn't it just be great if this prophet guy can help point us in the direction? Wonder what he's going to say. Let's see what he says. Verse 21. And he began to say to them, Today, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. So Luke tells us he wants to provide to Theophilus and by extension, by God's grace to us, an orderly narrative of the things that have been something among us. Now, I hope already you can start to begin to understand what needs to fill in that blank. Uh, the Greek word there is a really long one. Peple raphore menon. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Peple raphore menon. Okay? And, and what does that mean? It means to fill up. You see how this glass isn't totally full of water? Man, wouldn't it be great to fill it to the top, to the brim? This is what this word means. Uh, to be fulfilled. And Luke is telling us, I'm writing this gospel so you can know what has been fulfilled, completed. You know, it's all given. The, the, the supper's ready. The cup is filled, overflowing. My cup runneth over. Yes, totally, Luke's saying. It's happened. It has happened. Have been fulfilled. Uh, I don't know why the ESV, I like the ESV, but for some reason it goes with just accomplish. And, and the word, the verb does mean to accomplish, but it has a bigger meaning classically. And virtually all the major commentators, uh, the, the, the kind of the giants of commentary on Luke, almost all go with the fulfilled emphasis. Duplessis, um, Edwards, uh, Fitzmeyer, Joseph Fitzmeyer, the great Catholic uh, biblical commentator back in the 70s, does a, a numerous excursus on this issue that you're talking about the third meaning here, the classic graphic meaning fulfilled um, all the way through. Here's the way David Garland, um, who, who teaches at Baylor, he, he puts it this way. History for Luke is not merely one thing after another, but has a purpose and is moving somewhere. It's not just a random of sorts. You know how we talk about there's a designer to the creation? There's also a designer to history. Do you hear what, what this is? Luke is understands that. Luke is telling this early on. It's not just history, your story. What happens to you in your life? It's not just one thing after another. There is a great designer, a providential God involved here. So um, not merely one thing or another, but, but has a purpose and is moving somewhere. The events he, Luke, records are not mere occurrences, but are things that have been filled up. Do you hear that? 
things that have been filled up or fulfilled. Okay. So, Luke. Luke is telling us about what has been fulfilled. Now, that's the verb there, the peple referee may known, is perfect passive. The perfect mean it's done, baby. I mean, it is, it's just like it sounds. I mean, <laughs> that's the tense. It is done perfectly. Um, but you notice it's also passive. And so we've got a couple of questions being begged here. First of all, the most obvious question, who's the actor? Who, <laughs> who has done all this fulfilling? And the second thing is, what, what exactly are you talking about, Luke? What has been fulfilled? So we're going to sweep through the scripture today, basically introduce you to Luke. Again, I'm encouraging you to start reading Luke as you move through Christmas and into the new year. And then we'll be in Luke for a long time. You can kind of circle back around it. You can go back with your children and say, hey, remember when we read this earlier? Well, now pastor just talked about this passage, and we can even add this to understanding this. So hopefully God will, will bless us in that way. But So these basic questions, who has has brought the fulfillment and what has been fulfilled. Who? Uh, I'm trusting you're going to be able to fill in these blanks pretty quickly as we move through here. Hopefully you're going to know. Okay, so there's actually going to be three parts to the answer of who. And I'll give you a big hint here. Luke is decidedly, in God's word, is decidedly Trinitarian in introducing us to the gospel. So, who? Uh, who? Number one, uh, who? We got a blank space there. Back when Gabriel appears to Mary, and we'll, we'll be into the scripture a little bit later this, in, in the new year, but you may remember this. Gabriel appears to Mary, and he says, you know, you're going to conceive and bear a son, and he's going to be called the son of the Most High. And she says, how is this going to be? I, I'm a virgin. I, I'm not even married yet. How is this going to be? You may remember this. Gabriel responds, and he says, for nothing will be impossible with blank. Is the answer there the shepherds in the field? No. Is the answer there Joseph? Is the answer there Martin Leifer? No. Is the answer you? No, no. The answer is, guess what? Guess who? God. Nothing will be impossible with God. Over in Romans, when Paul is talking about Abraham's saving, justifying faith, Paul says that Abraham was fully persuaded that somebody was able to do what he had promised. Do my promises always come true? Does daddy and mama's promises always come true? No, my promises die when I go into the dirt too, okay? My promises sometimes aren't as good as the paper they're written on. Whose promises always come true? God. That's what Abraham believed. God was able to do what he promised, even though Abraham's old and he doesn't have a son yet and all of this, he doesn't have the promised land yet. Who? God. For nothing will be impossible with God. Abraham was fully persuaded God's able to do what he promised. Now, let's continue though. God in, and then you'll see there's a blank space there. God acting in. I wonder how God is going to come and enact what he's promised. God in whom? Well, over to the prologue to Luke's second book, Acts chapter 1, verse 1. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that somebody began to do and teach. I wonder who that somebody would be. What's the first gospel all about? It's all about Jesus. And notice this, Jesus began to do and teach, so he fulfills everything, but he's still working now. You know what he's working in your life? He's working in the early church. So um, who has brought this to fulfillment? God in Jesus. God in Jesus. God was in the world reconciling the world unto himself. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Paul says. Um, God was in Jesus reconciling the world to himself. Who? God in Jesus. By someone's power. Well, I wonder whose power that's going to be. Uh, the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, the United Nations. I wonder whose power this is going to be that's going to bring all this about. God in Jesus by the Holy Spirit's power. By the Holy Spirit's power. Um, Gabriel, back to Gabriel with Mary, in one of the classic Christmas passages, Gabriel, Gabriel explaining what's going to happen says, the something something will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. 
What do you fill in the blank there with? When Jesus is baptized, the something, something descended on him in bodily form like a dove. Who is this? Who's the answer? It's two words. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, Gabriel says. That's how. When Jesus is baptized, the Holy Spirit descends on him in bodily form like a dove. Okay, now what? What has been fulfilled? Um, got a lot of blanks here. The something also known as the something something. Uh, back when Jesus, the risen Jesus, is talking to and explaining the gospel to the two disciples who don't recognize him at first when they're on the road to Emmaus after Jesus is risen from the dead, he says, all that the prophets have spoken, in other words, about the Messiah, the Lord, all that the prophets have spoken, well, that's a short-term version of speaking about what we call the Hebrew Scriptures. Because the Hebrew Scriptures are delivered by prophets, general terms. What's been fulfilled? The Scriptures. It's what Paul and Jesus would refer to as the Scriptures, what we call the Old Testament. Okay, the Old Testament. So the Scriptures of the Old Testament, that's what's been fulfilled. Jesus says, all that the prophets have spoken. Now, in the passage that we read today, when Jesus is talking to his apostles, then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me, in other words, about the Messiah, in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. We'll come back to the second part of that. Let's start with the first, the central part, really, must, dei. Uh, de, de, uh, the, 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 the Greek there that's translated as it was necessary actually means like to be bound. And in old Southern American language, some people used to say, I'm bound to do this. Y'all ever heard that before? He's bound to do this. Well, that means he's tied to it. It's going to happen. In biblical terms, it means covenant commitment. Okay, so it's not just that it was necessary, it was bound to happen because God had committed himself to this covenantally. That, that's actually what's being said there. So when Jesus says it was necessary, he's like, the, the, all, all of my covenant promises connect this and it was bound to happen. It was going to happen that the Messiah was going to suffer and die for your sin and rise again. So, uh, and he, notice this, he says, um, must be Fulfill. There's that verb again. You see, Jesus is talking about fulfillment all the time. Are y'all catching this? He's talking about fulfillment, filling up, bringing to completion all the time. And here he's talking about, let's see, what is he saying must be fulfilled? What must be filled up? The, notice this is the way Jesus refers to it. The law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Now, if you talk to a Jewish person, they don't refer to uh, their scriptures as the Old Testament. What do they call it? The Tanakh, right? And that's an acronym. So you get the three parts of the Jewish Bible or the Old Testament. Torah, T, okay, the law. The prophets, Nevaim, that's, the, okay. And Ketuvim, the writings. So Jesus just referred to the full sweep of the Old Testament. Psalms is the first and largest book in the writings, and so that's a short-form way of referring to the Ketuvim, the writings. So Jesus just told you the whole Tanakh. The whole Tanakh is fulfilled in me. This, this had to happen. Um, now, what has been fulfilled? Let's keep going. It's not just the scripture. What is contained in the Tanakh? What's contained in, in, in all the scripture? God's something and God's something else, and I'm going to go ahead and give you this timing, four and two, Israel, Abraham, David, and Israel's Messiah. Okay, what's fulfilled? Let's start off with this. God's plan. God's plan. My plan? No. God's plan. Who owns the plan? God does. And I get that. You, you, you can talk about God's plan, big form, or God's plans that fall in with the plan. Okay? 
Um, so it's God's plan. You know, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. God, God's plan. And then um, God's promise or promises. God's big promise of redemption and then the promises that connect with that. God's promise or promises and timing for Israel, for Abraham, for David, and for Israel's Messiah. Now, I really want to emphasize this because this is important for us to understand. It's God's planned timing. We all have when we want things exactly when we want them, right? Life doesn't work that way, and salvation doesn't work that way. The gospel doesn't work that way. It's God's timing. So notice this. Let's go to the, the very center of the Christmas story. Luke chapter 2, verse 6. The days were something for her to give birth. Guess what the best translation there is? It's the play ra'o verb. Yeah, it's the play ra'o verb again. The days were fulfilled. And you can just kind of brush over that and say, well, I guess she was about nine months pregnant. No, that is not what that, yeah, she is about nine months pregnant, but that's not what that's saying, folks. This is a major gospel statement. In all of world history, in the entirety of human existence, God picked this time, and the days were fulfilled exactly when Jesus was born. That's what, that's what Luke is saying in chapter 2, verse 6. The days were were fulfilled for her to give birth. Let's go back to what Jesus says when he's preaching in Nazareth. After reading Isaiah 61 and saying, oh yeah, we can't wait for that great golden age sometime in the future when God... Jesus says, I tell you the truth, today, fulfilled. I'm it. Today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Well, what has been fulfilled? God's planned timing. Um... What has been fulfilled? God's plans, God's promises, God's timing. And let's go even bigger now. Not only for Israel, not only for the scripture and God's covenant with Israel and with Abraham and David, but for the whole world. All of world history, the entire story of creation and cosmology and the entire existence of anything we know. It's all fulfilled in Jesus. Luke and John point us to that big picture reality. I mean, Matthew and Mark do, yes, it's, it's there, but God really inspired Luke and John in different ways. They're very different writers, with, but they're, they're both pointing us in this way. The entire story of everything is fulfilled in Jesus. Uh, the story of the world, all, all people, all people, that's the answer there, all people, Jews and Gentiles, the world and all its history. Listen to this, Jesus again, going back to what we read. Jesus explaining this to the apostles. The Messiah should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. What is fulfilled? The story of the world, all history. When Jesus, the baby, is presented in the temple, we'll come back to this again in a few weeks, okay? Simeon, Simeon the prophet says this, for my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all people a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Matthew's genealogy to begin the New Testament traces Jesus back to Abraham. Covenant, good covenant theologian there, Matthew. David and Abraham. Luke, when he gives Jesus genealogy in chapter 3, Guess where he traces back to? Anybody know? Adam. The entirety of human history, Jesus is fulfilling. Luke is telling you that. Now, what is fulfilled? The gospel, yes, the gospel. But it's 
the gospel of something and something else. You gotta have two, you gotta have both sides of this coin now. The gospel of salvation. And I can tell you this, the way I read Luke, I, I basically understand the, that the whole thesis of Jesus' gospel ministry summed up in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, which is in the Zacchaeus exchange. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. I mean, that's the good news. He came to seek and to save the lost. And by the way, if you don't think you're lost, you're probably not going to save, right? So uh, admit you're lost. But then speaking of that and speaking of our response, the other side is judgment. It's a gospel of salvation through judgment. Jesus ultimately, for everyone who believes in him, takes the judgment upon himself. And, and we just talked about in the opening of this service, God's proclamation under that saving grace. But it's a salvation through judgment. Jesus says this, Luke chapter 12, verse 51. Do not think that I have come to give peace on earth. No, I tell you, but rather division. Mamas and daddies, family members, friends and neighbors, everybody's got to make a decision. You're one side or the other. Jesus says, I come to bring division. It, it's here. I'm offering salvation, but judgment is the other option. Back to Simeon. Um, he, he says, Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light for revelation of the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And then Simeon says to Joseph and Mary, and his father and mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them, this is Joseph and Mary, and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed, and a sword will pierce your own soul also. This is very similar to what we just sang with the Magnificat, you know, right before I preached. Uh, the Magnificat, through God's inspiration, Mary saying the same kind of thing, the rising and falling, judgment, but salvation through judgment. Ultimately, we see this with Jesus and what he's come to do. Um, in the transfiguration, when Jesus' heavenly glory is revealed, to Peter, James, and John on the mountain as Jesus prepares to go to the cross. Moses and Elijah are speaking with Jesus. This is at the transfiguration, Luke 9, 30 and 31. Behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his exodon. I wonder what that word is. Well, I got a blank space for you there. You, you ought to be able to guess that one. Which he was about to blank in Jerusalem. If you've been paying attention, you're going to be able to fill in these blanks really easily. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his exodus. In other words, his exodus. His exodus, what does that mean? What happens in the exodus? Israel is delivered, the Hebrews are delivered from death through the blood of the Lamb. You don't have to know that much about the Bible to understand what Jesus is talking about with Moses and Elijah. He's going to be the lamb. He's going to be the blood, his blood, through which we are delivered from hell and death into salvation and life. It's the big exodus towards which the initial exodus points. So Jesus is talking about that with Moses and Elijah, which he was about to, guess what? Come on, you know the verb here, right? He was about to fulfill at Jerusalem. And now finally, fulfilled among us. Fulfilled among us, Luke says. Don't skip over among us. Number one, we talked about this with the introduction last week. It is to eyewitnesses who are subject to cross-examination and persecution. It is a history. Luke is talking about real history among us. But there's a deeper meaning here too. If Jesus has come for salvation through judgment and fulfilled all this among us, that means we each must respond. Let me repeat that. It is among us. That means among you and me. That's what Luke is saying. He's saying, here it is. It's good news. What are you gonna do with the fulfillment and the one who fulfills among us? This extends to you and to me. 
And the question is, how am I going to respond? How are you going to respond to the Savior of the world? I'll give you two examples. Now, both these people end up blessed. They're, they're both, okay, Zechariah is okay. But notice this in the lead up to the Christmas story. When Gabriel says to Zechariah, his barren old wife, who is long past her cycle, is going to have a son, Zechariah says, there's no way. And Gabriel says to Zechariah, because you did not believe my words, which will be blank in their time. What's the verb there? Fulfilled. Yes, you guys are on this now. Yes, they will be fulfilled. And guess what? In their time. I know you wanted to have a baby when she was 18 or 20 or 22 or whatever. You didn't get it then. But now in her old age, I'm telling you, that's God's timing. That's when God wants to fulfill it. We're too old. Ever said, I'm too old for something? <laughs> Zechariah. The, no, no, no. Zechariah, you need to believe when God says he's going to fulfill something, it's his time and he's going to do it. And then to um, Mary, when she goes to see Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, you may remember this, John the Baptist leaps in Elizabeth's womb. And right after that, uh, Elizabeth says this to Mary, right before the Magnificat, we just say, blessed is she who believed there would be a... Um, of what was spoken to her? The answer there is fulfillment. Okay. I will tell you a truth in advertising. That's a telos, which means like getting to the end, the grand conclusion of things. It's not a plerao verb, but it's the same kind of thing. There will be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Mary believed. Mary believed God's going to do what he said he's going to do. Mary trusted in God's timing, even though it was crazy, seemingly from a human perspective. What about you? What Luke's gospel tells us, what Luke's gospel tells me, is that because God has done this, and because the entire story of the world has been fulfilled in Jesus, and your story is fulfilled in Jesus, he's making a total claim on you and on me. I'm officiating a wedding this afternoon. There's a bride and a groom. There's, there's a bunch of uh, groomsmen and bridesmaid. If the fourth groomsman over, if somebody asks him next week how was the wedding, and he talks about how he looked and all that he did at the wedding, and that's all he talks about, did he kind of miss the wedding? Yes, he missed the wedding. Is the story all about the fourth groomsman over here? Huh? Is the story about him? Is the wedding really? No, no. They need to look upstairs to what? The bride and the groom. Is the story is your story really about you? Are you really the hero of your story? Most people think that way. I need to fulfill myself. I need to find myself. I need to fulfill my story. You're not the fulfillment, my brother, my sister. Who is? Who fulfills the story? Jesus. Yield to him. Yield to him and let him bring blessing beyond measure. And when you do, let me tell you a couple indications that you're doing that. Your life, your actions, your character, where you put your brain in, you know, in the morning and the evening, that will all begin to line up more and more with Jesus and his gospel. And also flowing from that, you will proclaim his good news to others. We are entering the next couple of weeks, the easiest time, one of the easiest times in the year to talk to other. How was your Christmas? Well, it was kind of nice. How was your Christmas? Oh, it was awesome. It was totally fulfilled. What do you mean totally fulfilled? Well, let me tell you about Jesus. Are you willing to open up to other people about your faith? If you have been fulfilled in Jesus, if you know him, if you're alive in him, you will. The Holy Spirit will empower this. God in Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, will work through you. May you and I respond this Christmas season to the truth of the Christmas message and the whole gospel. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you, and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.